Welcome World Outreach Revival Center. Alan, we're live right now on Facebook, brother. You are like the star um, right here. <laughs> we welcome you guys this morning on Facebook. And those that are here, those that are on their way here. And this is the day that the Lord has made and we will do what? Rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Um, God is good. This is Memorial Day. Remember those who have served. And uh, amen. Let's just get right into worshiping the Lord. Because he's a good God. Amen. Can we give the Lord one big hand of praise? So let's come to the Lord. Father, we come in agreement right now for these on live and these here. Lord, thank you that we can join together in the house of God. Thank you, Lord, for our president that announced this week that the church is essential. Thank you, God, that, that there's a declaration that it's important for us to be able to unite together. We pray for those states, Lord, that are battling right now in your protection today, Father. We pray for your favor. Bless this service this morning, Lord. Bless each one online. Come with prophecy, word of knowledge. Come with your spirit, God. Touch us. Move on us, Lord. Let your name be glorified in Jesus' name. And we all sin. Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord one more hand if you would. I do want to make a quick announcement um, for the churches here. You see the uh, regulations on the walls. I've taped them everywhere. Just as a reminder for people to um, do the social distancing thing. Now, the best thing I can tell you is if you shake someone's hand, sanitize your hands. Because it's, it's just easy to be done. And I don't want to not shake your hand. So if I shake your hand, you go sanitize. I go sanitize. We're always sanitized. And uh, your hands will be dried out, but it's, it's worth the handshake. Um, but let's be cautious. There are a couple of churches out of this state, I think Georgia and Tennessee, um, that two pastors have passed away from the virus, two more, and it began to spread through the churches that they pastored. Uh, one at a funeral, that it spread. So just be, be cautious, is all we're asking, so that if uh, someone does carry that virus and we can kill that joker in the name of Jesus or with sanitizer. I don't care how it's done, it's got to go. Amen? So I'm going to ask you on Facebook, are you ready to worship the Lord? I'm going to ask you at World Outreach, are you ready to worship the Lord? Come on, stand your feet if you would. Give Jesus a shout of praise. Damn, come on. Good and I can't be you are good and I shall be 
what you do you you listen to the words and you let them get inside your spirit and you allow them do you, do you know how a song is written in the Christian world it's written by the Holy Spirit 
God will drop it into a heart of a man or a woman and they'll in an instant right now by the spirit of God I believe the enemy writes songs too but I'm talking about the spirit of God I think some of you don't even remember this name because you just maybe too young or didn't ever pay attention but there was a lady named Dottie Rambo anybody ever heard that name before yeah. Do you know there was a room in Dottie Rambo's house that angels were in all the time? And they would literally give her songs in the spirit and she would write them. And there are songs right now that have been saying for years and years and years. Well, I, I want to put that back up there, uh, Dalton, if you would, the last part we just did. You're real to me. I've known it from the start. There's no space between heaven and my heart. You're near to me. I've never been too far. And in the in-between, you brought heaven to my heart. Do you know what that means to me? That means God says, it, it, go, go to the trust one. Keep going back to the, the chorus, maybe. What is it? The last part. When it was all simple and loving was easy. When it was all simple and trusting was easy. And for many people, they say, man, it's not as easy to trust anymore. And it's not as easy to love anymore because the world and, and the circumstances of life and age and mistakes and failures and viruses and financial difficulty and marital difficulty and addiction difficulty and this difficulty and that difficulty. And we come to the place saying, God, we can't trust you and we can't love the way we used to when we were young. Well, I've got news for you. Yes, you can. You might not be able to take all the walls down around people because people do things, but you can take those walls down around God. You can. I look at the babies walking around the church and and we're calling them young prophets because we're really trying to keep them uh, from prophesying too loud. Thank you. You guys are doing great on it. But you know those babies, they know how to love and they know how to trust. It's pretty simple. Because they just let everything go. Can you, this morning, let everything go in your life. Let every problem, every thought, every issue, every distraction, every fear, every circumstance, can we just let them go and say, God, when it was all simple, I'm making it simple right now. For God so loved the world, he died. We can throw all of our trust in him, just step on the water and walk. When it was all simple and trusting was easy. So Caleb, I'd like to do those two parts if you can just go through one more time if you don't mind. And I want to challenge you, church. I'm going to say this. It breaks my heart because there are people, I'm going to look on Facebook as well, that know about God. They go to church. They might even sing a song. They might even read a scripture. But they're missing the best part. I thank God for me being saved. You know what being saved means? That I get to go to heaven when I die. But I'm alive right now and here. So if it's all just about me thinking about what's going to be, this is really not that good of a deal. But if I can think about what's going to be right now, can heaven and my heart connect right now? I know some people that have had the worst of the worst lives. Some of us think we have it worse than anybody else until you meet somebody that's got it a whole lot worse. Well, being a pastor, you meet a lot of people. And I have seen this one called Jesus reach into the heart and connect a man's heart to God's heart and transform that individual. Where the frown goes to a smile, where the misery turns to joy. 
where, where the, the fear turns to peace and where people say, what happened to you? And they don't have any words to say except for Jesus. Have you surrendered lately? Do you know it's an everyday process? It's an everyday thing to say, God, I'm trusting you today. God, I'm trusting you with my situation. Sister Tammy and I go through some things we've got to take care of. In the last week, every day, we're reminding ourselves, we trust you, God, with it. We trust you, God, with it. We trust you, God, with it. Loving you is easy. Trusting you is easy. When I take down the barriers and the walls and say, here I am, God. You can say, well, I don't even know him. If you know him that much, it's close enough to get you there. If I remind you, he said, if you have faith in the mustard seed, you can speak to the mountain and tell it to be removed and cast into the sea. So can we just take this song and let the words saturate your heart and your mind? I'm going to challenge the children, the teenagers. Get into it. And let him have his way. Come on, Caleb. Just a little bit more worship.
gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you.
we worship you. Do you understand? A song like that is prophetic in nature that you're declaring over your family the blessings of God. You are. You have that right and that ability. And it's very strong. Parents, listen to me. Guardians, listen to me. You go to that place of prayer and declaration. I worship you, Lord. I worship you. I worship you. Come on, just worship him for a minute, please. Just worship him for a minute. virus right now and where our world is headed and and God is just showing me that your ministry is needed in warfare over lives of people even if it's just at home it's playing uh, don't underestimate the gift don't underestimate the value I hear God saying son I need your warfare spirit to come out and to break the bondages in some lives and set them free. So Father, I pray over my brother right now, Lord, that you'll begin to stir and activate and move in him in a powerful way. Lord God, that demonic assignments, Lord, strongholds. But I'm really hearing the Spirit say in this end time season that we're in, your gift is essential. The value of it right now is probably greater than any other season in time. Right now. So God, we just declare that gift to be stirred up in warfare. Lord, whatever time of night, I know God needs to play in the middle of the night. Whatever you've got to do, God. Lord, the kingdom needs it. Do you understand the kingdom of God needs your gift, church? The kingdom of God needs your gift. Father, I pray for everyone in the house and every gift in this certain season of time, the value of their gift is increasing. And necessary. My God, my God, my God, my God, my God. 
Just sing that a little bit in the last part. Come on. Come on. Come on, church. I saw someone sitting at a keyboard playing. It wasn't Kayla, but I didn't know who it was. She just confirmed what I said to my brother. Can you come on, give God some great good for it. God always confirms his word, guys. I don't have the two witnesses. Come on. Come on. I'm gonna ask you if you can stand your feet for one more moment just before the Lord to honor him. Come on. You keep go ahead. It's all right. Come on, church, come on. I'm 
children because I'm old, not because you're young. <laughs> I see literally a deposit from the two of you, and God said that deposit is powerful. And so, you know, Isabella and Samuel, I'm trying to get the names of the babies, where they at? Anyway, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to remember them all. Sorry, guys, I'm terrible. But what has been deposited in each of you is a powerful, powerful, powerful anointing. It's very strong. I'm telling you, it's very strong. And it's not just like parents just gave it to you. It was God praying it in, given to you. Am I right? You guys prayed it into them. And the anointing is in you guys. So... Trust God in that. 
You may say, well, I don't feel like I'm much. I'm going to tell you what's in you is very powerful. It's very powerful. Don't underestimate the value of what has been placed in you. You may never minister just like they are, but you will do works in the kingdom of God because he's deposited inside of you. Many in this room have had deposits. This, this is a ministry team, missionaries in, in Italy, and God has deposited in every one of your children something powerful and something great, I'm telling you. So don't sit back and say, well, what, what about me? Or God, are you going to use me? Or I, I don't know about this. In your own way, in your own person, whomever you are, God says, I want to use you in the way that you are. But it's a powerful, don't underestimate it. I want you guys to listen to me. I was 20, how old was I, Pam, when I called into the ministry? 20, 27 years old. But my mother, my father, the ministry had deposited into me. I didn't know at 27, God said, it's time now. And my world was transformed because it was already in me. So you don't have to make this thing happen. It's just in you, and it's going to grow. It's going to grow. Tony, I've got to pray for you, Melissa, if you don't mind. Just come up here, brother. Sorry. I've been trying not to. No offense. Just, just come stand right there. Are you hearing me? You don't have to make it happen. Listen, there's nothing to fear. You just trust God. And when the time comes, God's going to just explode it out of you. That's what God does. Shelly, just stand up if you don't mind, please. Father, I just pray for her right now in Jesus' name. I pray for an anointing to begin to flow through her in greater measure than has ever been in her life. My God, I just, just speak your presence over her, your Holy Spirit to overshadow her, your peace to rest on her, God. We declare it, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, your presence, God, your presence, God, your presence. Shelly, I just hear the Lord saying, I'm going to serve and I'm going to activate, but it's going to be like brand new, fresh gifts, but it's the same, but it's like it's been rebirthed. God says, I'm going to do more in you than you've done in the past, but it's going to be of the same thing. This is going to be so fresh and so anointed. So God says, I'm going to move on you, daughter, with freshness. I just hear that. I know that's not a deep word. Come on, stretch your hands toward this couple. Father, in Jesus' name, I lift up Tony and Melissa, Lord. My God, right now, from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet, Lord. Come on, just pray with me, church. Father, we lift them up. 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 My God, not by mind nor by power, but by your spirit. And Tony, I heard the Holy Spirit say a little while ago that he united you two together, that it's not an accident, and that God says there's still work for you to do in the kingdom. And I know your job situation, all that you do, but don't be in despair and don't be discouraged. God says, I have work for the two of you to do, says the Lord. I have work for the two of you to do. My God, my God, my God, in Jesus' name. So, Father, whatever you've got to do on the journey, use them, Lord, daily. But even together, God, even together. My God, my God, my God, my God. Tony, literally, I hear the Holy Spirit say, you guys will minister together in some areas that he has for you. So, Lord, we thank you for it, God. When and how, I don't know. And what, I don't know, but I know. It's not to always be separated and always be here and there. God says, I'm going to use you together. And in that togetherness, you will find more peace and more strength than you've ever had, says the Lord. It will be my joy. It will be my satisfaction. It will be my fulfillment inside of you, says the Lord. So don't be discouraged or in despair. God says, I'm going to use you together, says the Lord. I designed it that way. And I don't make mistakes, says the Lord. Have a ready heart, an open mind, and open ears. Hear what the Spirit says. Because God says, I will use you together. That's a promise. That's a promise. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father.
Well, give the Lord a hand of praise if you want. One last time, get in sit in that part of the will never run dry. He says, if you're thirsty, I will give you to drink. You receive that? Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. Pastor Marcus, if you come. My God. the strangest things I saw in my life. I saw God say he went back to generations back, the lineage and dipped into a well and drew up the drums to pour them into you. I don't even understand. I don't know if there's been anybody in the family that's ever played drums before. I'm just saying the anointing is very powerful for destroying the enemy. Amen. 
We're going to receive the offering this morning. Thank you so much for being here. Please remember um, that we are raising funds for the Children's Church building. It's air conditioning. If you're online, um, we're raising funds for our air conditioning. Uh, for two units is seven thousand dollars, and that's not anything for God to handle. Can I get an amen? But um, most churches are not having children church right now. Um, I would like to have it, but the facility is too small, and so our nursery we're going to probably end up having to watch our babies back here, a little bigger space when we do, and we want to have our children in the building in the back so they can have plenty of space. And um, so we've already got, I think, a couple of thousands come in already. So that's exciting to me. Amen. Um, and so I thank you for your giving. And uh, last week someone wrote just a pledge, an IOU. And that's good. I don't care what you put down. It's an IOU is fine. Uh, but all the money will go towards the air conditioning and heating. And uh, we're going to help install it. And uh, it'll be awesome. So we're thankful for that. Thank you for coming today. We appreciate each one of you. And those online, thank you for being online today. And uh, gosh, we love you. We love you. Pastor Marcus, if you're ready, please sanitize my mic before I hand it to you. Everybody came back with the right attitude. And I mean, we had 40, 40 something kids in the room. And, and I was like, this is this is like we never even missed. And so can we as adults follow the lead of our young people? And, and let's just go for it next week when we come in here. Of course, today's not over with, but you get my point today. Because he's still good. He's still God. He's still in control. You believe that? Say amen. amen. And so I'm trusting him and believing him. And uh, and so even when things don't look right. He's still in control, and he's still got it all figured out. So that being said, I didn't mean to fuss at you this morning, but I want to encourage you. Hey, go ahead and look at yourself in the mirror today. You know what? I know I can do better. I know I can be better. And let's just change things up a little bit and come in with next week with just reckless abandon. Let's just go for it, man. Why, why not? You know? He's king of kings and lord of lords. It's crazy. So that's my encouragement to you today. Uh, uh, and, and not really necessarily offering related other than your praise is offering. If you study it out, you will see. And so, uh, sure, certainly I'm up here for a financial part of that. Pastor's already hit the hot spots for it, so I won't spend any time on it. But uh, but to me, 
sacrifice of praise uh, goes far above it. And if you read out scripture, you'll see what I'm talking about. So it's one thing to give money, but if you're not praising him from here, you're kind of missing the whole thing. So anyway, love you guys. Not mad at anybody. Just wanted to say, let's do it, man. Let's encourage one another. All right. Next week, even when you come in and say, hey, we're going to do this thing. So, hey, May's a pretty cool uh, month. I'm going to sidetrack just a minute because I ain't going to do the offering. Uh, but um, uh, about to... I don't know how many days ago it was. It was 13 days ago. Or no, not quite 13 days ago. It was 10 days ago, something like that. I made 45 tri trips around the sun. Y'all know what that means? Yeah, it was my birthday. I made 45. So I'm glad about that. And I always remember because mine's the 13th, and pastors is always double mine in May. This is the 26th. How many of y'all knew that already? Yeah, okay. So this is this week. Yeah. Woo, tough crowd today, Pastor. I'm trying to get them for you. I, you know, I'm trying to get them warmed up. But uh, so anyway, we're, we're excited. And uh, Sister Joyce is coming up here. Yeah, come on right quick. And then we'll do we'll do the offering right after that as soon as she runs up here. And because uh, I think there's some cars floating around. Look, that's pretty good. You can make it time there. Yeah, that's good stuff. So uh, she, she wanted to pause for this. So I think it's just important. Yeah? So come on, Pastor. Run up here. Come on. You got to run just like her. I want to see you. Hi, first of all, I want to say how many of you guys really appreciate him? Oh, I'm, I'm going to really pour it in right now because I got the mic. <laughs> I, I want to thank all of you guys for, for sneaking around, and that's hard to do with him because he don't miss nothing. And, and I know he was wondering why I wasn't praying, but, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, Pastor, we want to present this to you, and this is something special. If you want to open that now, you can. Just pull something out. <laughs> but look what it says. What does it say? Right here. All right. <laughs> we take care of you, don't we? We love you, Pastor. We appreciate everything you do. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everybody gets a sign the card. Start it there. Um, so, at, at any rate, so I uh, appreciate everybody indulging us there for just a moment. So, if you got an offering today you want to bless the Lord with, why don't you get it out right now? Let's just lift it before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's just honor him. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give. We thank you for our, our pastor. Pray for blessings upon him. I just sold. Uh, Tina, last night as we were talking about it, I, I do not think I am capable of doing what he does. And uh, we are honored to be under him. We thank you for putting him in charge. We pray you bless him and keep him this, this year. Let this be a, a prosperous year. And fathers, we lift our offerings to you. We honor you today. We pray that, Father, every need would be met and open, open the windows of heaven for us in Jesus' mighty name. And we thank you, Father. Somebody say amen. amen. All right, Bible says we're going to be cheerful givers. It's now time to give the offering. staying in the main building, I think this is a great opportunity for revival. Amen? Because our kids will be right in the middle of it. And uh, so they're being taught how to give at a very young age. <laughs> how many uh, in the building are military, retired, active, or anything? If you're a military person, stand your feet if you would. Um, yeah. Amen. Oh, wait, wait. Who else? If you're willing to make a stand up so we can see. We just got. Just Tony? Brother Bob, where are you at? Is he standing? Are you, you're military? No. Did it say no?
Let me see here. It's called Man of God. Yeah. So you can have uh, faith and courage. I know the plans I have for you. Or I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Which one? Yeah. This one. <laughs> yeah. Come on, shut your hands towards me. Let's go. Yeah. All right, let's go. Father, thank you, Lord, for the men and the women of the military, God, that have uh, given their lives, Lord, all over this, this uh, world and nation. Bless them on this coming day, Father. Keep your hand on them. And those that have laid their lives down for the ultimate gift. Sacrifice for others. We thank you for it, Father. Lord, for those that have passed away that we know, Lord, my Father and others, Lord, we hold them up, God. Thank you for their gift to this world. And we honor them today in Jesus' name. Brother Chiro and Kathy and his whole family, they came in from Italy and couldn't go back. Um, the virus hit, and uh, they've been trying to figure out what, you, you know, that's really a strange position, is to be a, a minister, have a church in, in Italy, and come here to, to be with the people of your nation and get ready to go back, and you can't. And so um, they tried to figure out a lot of things, how to live and how to everything. But uh, Sister Tammy and I were uh, talking, um, yes, I think it was a Saturday, Friday. Chira, when did I ask you? Saturday or Friday? Friday. Friday. So I kind of threw it on him to speak this morning. And I love listening to him speak. So Chira, if you'd come and just speak the word of God to us today and um, just enjoy what God has to say, you will be blessed. I promise you. Um, and challenged. So, how many enjoyed the last time he shared? Come on, give him more than You want to bring the pulpit down here? Or up here? Can we get a couple of men to bring the pulpit down if you don't mind? And um, uh, they're going to give it for you. Uh, that's all right. This thing is, they got it. Good luck. like to hear because it's different. Yeah. Caleb, do we, is Caleb in here? Okay. Just go. Hello, hello. Eh, not too bad, not too bad, not too bad. Not too bad. Many times they call me to translate in Italy when men of God come from America, Australia, you know, English speaking countries. And there is this particular church that I don't like going. He's one of my best friends, pastor best friend of mine. But he doesn't have speakers at all. They use all those earbuds, I call them. And so they hear everything from here. So when the guy's standing next to me in the auditorium, I don't hear it because we are generally behind the speakers. There is not feedback. And whoever is a musician, I play keyboard and guitar. So, you know, whoever is a musician here knows that you, you got to hear the sound of your voice and the sound of your instrument because if you don't, then you're going to mess up 100%, right? Unless you're like Mozart, that you can be deaf and blind and still play. But, or Beethoven. But anyway, so he doesn't do it. Like, bro, if you don't put a speaker for me, I'm not going to come. So, last time he tricked me, he didn't put the speaker. He said he would, he didn't, but... It was awful. The American guy was so fast. It was good. I said, excuse me? Because it sounds like this. You don't hear. Because the voice was there. So that's why I'm here. And it sounds pretty good. But when it's close, you don't even have to yell. And which is really hard for any time not to do. Anyway, I just want to tell you that I, uh, on the 20th of May, I celebrated my 19th anniversary. Not my, my and my wife. 
That's why I'm calling it up right now, real quick. If you don't want to take more time of my time, just jog and come here. Run here. I'm going to have her sharing whatever is in her heart. She's the, I'm telling you guys, she's the best wife for me. I'm saying, I'm saying she's the match for my life. If she was not next to me, I would not make it the way I made it. And you know, you know what they say, a great man of God is defined by the praying, praying woman, by a woman, the great woman of God that is behind me. She's always encouraged me, even when we didn't have the money, we didn't have a car, we didn't have anything, because she, she trusted that I heard God, even when it didn't seem so, not just for a month, but for many years. She stuck with me, and she loved me, she encouraged me, she never told me, what have you done with my life? She never told me, you snatched me from America, from this well-being, to bring me in a nation when I don't understand the people, I don't understand the culture, and at certain point she hated the culture. Sometimes I hate it too, even though it's my culture, but it's very hard. And if you come to visit Italy, you're gonna be, a, you're gonna have a lot of good memories. But if you move to Italy, you know Italy is considered the graveyard of missionaries. Uh, Ninety percent of missionaries leave after two years. So if you say, I want to go to Italy and preach the gospel in Italy, in two years, you're going to come back here. That's what it is. Because of cultural difficulties, of a lot of, a lot of struggle. And Americans don't cope well with that kind of junk. Because Americans are like, just, I'll give you one, I'll give you one, take you my time. When we first moved there, she would go to the store and she would buy the groceries, she would go with the bags by the counter, somebody would come from outside, they would order mozzarella cheese, for example, and they would stop serving her and they would take care of the guy because he was in a hurry. And so twice she left the bags as I'm not gonna come back here. The groceries, the bags of groceries. That you were ready. If you're in line at Walmart, you have all of your $200 worth of groceries for your whole family on the thing, and someone says, oh, I've only got five items. They go in front of you. Well, like if four people do that, eventually I have to check out, right? I've got two babies. So anyway, I don't want to I don't want to stop anything here. I didn't call you for this. I'm just saying it's been, it was hard. I mean, you Americans understand this is hard. Here there is more respect. There is more... There is more space, there is more please and sorry and excuse me here. That is different. So if you're not used to that, you're going to just go back, I'm telling you. But she's stuck with it. Because, you know, I, I don't worry, God, you know, you know. Okay. Anyway, so she's the best. And uh, she wants to share something before I start my message. I'm going to kick you if you go too long. Um, I was talking with someone yesterday, and they reminded me of some, a little story that I had uh, shared with them before, and t this morning during worship, I really felt impressed, like, that maybe this is, well, not maybe, I'm sure, that this is something that is for other people. So, um, there's a book that I read with Samuel and Isabella when they were younger, and there was a spot in that book where a uh, shepherd, um, in a, it was an older guy who happened to be a shepherd in the town, had befriended this little girl. And she had, um, he had shared with her about Jesus. And then, and one day she prayed and she accepted Jesus into her heart. And so one day she's, she's wandering by and she visits him while he's sending the flock. And she said, but there's, I just don't understand. How do you hear God? Like when you pray or when you're, you know, if, how, how do you do it? How do you know that that's God that's talking? And the shepherd whistled like a little, it said he, he whistled a little whistle and all the sheep turned their head towards him and, and looked towards him and started walking towards him. And, and she looked at him and he said, you see those three or four sheep over there by the fence? They didn't lift their head at all. And, um, and she said, yes. And he said, watch again. And he whistled again a little bit. And the sheep, can, the, most of the flock continued walking faster towards him. And those other sheep saw, I mean, the ones that hadn't looked up, saw the other ones that were going towards the shepherd and they looked back at the shepherd but paused and kept on eating. He whistled again, I mean, they kept, he whistled the third time 
And those three or four that were by the, the you know, over towards the side, turned and started coming towards him with the whole rest of the flock. And he said, this is what it's like with the Father and in the body of Christ. He said, those sheep, their shepherd just passed away a few days ago, and they're new to my flock. His flock got divided amongst the other shepherds in the area, and this, these, these are new to my flock, so they don't know my call, my, the feeding call for these sheep. So when I whistle, my sheep know my voice. And they came, they knew it's feeding time. And so they turned and started coming. Those didn't recognize my voice at all. But the second whistle that I did, they saw that all the rest of my sheep were happily coming towards me. So they glanced, they watched for a second, but they were still kind of you know, thinking about it. But then the third time, they're like, okay, this, that, that was right. They knew the same whistle three times, it means food. So they came. So as the days and the weeks go by, they're going to know my voice, my whistle, the first time. But at first, it just takes them a little while. So it's the same thing with hearing from God. Sometimes when we're new in our walk with the Lord, He says something, or we think like, at first, sometimes they'll talk to us, and we have no clue. Like the first whistle, the sheep didn't have any clue what was going on. But that's what's so important with staying around other believers that are stronger than you, not just somebody else that's new to the flock. Because there were three or four new sheep and none of them turned the first time. It didn't mean they weren't part of the flock. He loved them just as much, but they weren't used to that word. But being, and I think it was a perfect example because he gave the prophetic word <clears throat> about Sam, and then she said, I heard that also. Um, and just as a, as a believer, so many times I'll feel something in my heart or like, okay, is that, is that God or is that not God? And I'm like, God, is that you? Was that your voice? It was like so still and quiet and I don't know if that was you. Then someone else will say, I just heard this. I just saw this. Or can I, can I pray this? One time praying for, for Mandy. I'm like, God, is that you? Is that not you? Is that you? Is that not you? And then it was like a confirm. Okay, that was. So... <laughs> And so it's like, I'm not saying that you had a doubt, but had there been a doubt in your mind about, okay, you know, what does this connect with? Then, oh, he gave the word and like, okay, yes, we're on the same page. So you're, it just, it's like a little a tuning thing. Like, okay, now I got it. I'll hear it a few more times. But when you fill your ears with things that are not in line with God, whether it's music or friendships or television, it just fogs it all out. Had there been 10 other shepherds whistling or calling, those sheep would have never gotten in tune with the rest of the flock. They had to focus on getting in tune with that voice so that they could get fed and, and live adequately. So that's my... Called, uh, when the shepherd takes the sheep to the field, it's a pasture. Is that the way you call it? Pasture. Huh? Pasture. 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 Oh, it's going to be tough. No, because that, she didn't know my message. She doesn't know my message. I didn't know what she was going to share. I just asked her because we prayed in the room with you about her if she shared anything. And, um, and uh, at a certain point, this is going to be connected. I just didn't know how to say it. Were, never mind. I agree with Marcus. There is a struggle in this place. There is a pastor that is pushing forward. There is an incredible worship team. And Caleb is an anointee. Unbelievable. I told the pastor uh, a month ago. I'm like, I don't even know why he's not a world uh, uh, worship world leader. There is an amazing gift that you have in this house. And, uh, but I don't know why people struggle so much to get into the into that presence that makes you forget that the kids are running around, that the air conditioning is too cold, or if it's too hot, or if there is a, the camera. Just release yourself to go into worship. And this is good, is good also for the people around you. Because people see you and see you like you can just watch a movie. Actually, many people get more excited when they watch a game or... You know, and then, you know, let's bring this thing in a different level because it's important. You know, the Bible says, I dwell in the presence of my people. He dwells there. 
He's here because he's omnipresent, but he dwells in the presence of his people. And if we let go for a second, how about we do it now? Let's stand up, everybody. Stand up and let's praise for one minute. We give you glory, Jesus. Just open your mouth and just let the praise go out of your mouth in this moment. Say whatever to, you want to say to God in this moment that has to do with praise and thanksgiving. Thank God that you are here today. Thank God that you are alive. Thank God that you have a job if you do. And if you don't, thank God anyway because He's going to provide one for you. In Jesus' name, just open your mouth. Open your mouth and from the, the outcome of your heart, let praises flow. He's worthy to be praised, the Bible says. He's worthy to be praised. Do it. Do it right now in the name of Jesus. We glorify you, Jesus. Tell Him whatever you want that has to do with praising Him and worshiping Him. And you bind down to His will. In Jesus' name, I bind every spirit that is resisting the power of God from moving mightily in this place with revival signs and wonders. Every day, every meeting in Jesus' name. I'm going to prophesy that this is going to happen in Jesus' name. And every resisting spirit, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Lose these people. Lose this place in Jesus' name. I declare the kingdom of God like Jesus you taught, us, taught us to pray. Let your kingdom come right now. Your, your, let your will be done in Jesus' name. Come on, let me hear you praise God. Yell at Him. Yell in Jesus' name. Raise your volume. Come on. Pretend your, your football, you know, your basketball. I don't know what you watch. It just scored a goal. Come on. But give it to God. All the praise. It's more worthy than NASCAR. It's more worthy than the Cubs. It's more worthy than, uh, you know, the New Orleans team or the Alabama team or whatever you root for. Just it's more worthy of your words, of your praise, of your shouting to Him. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. You had enough? Come on, Jesus. Thank you, God. Be serious before you. Say, God, I want to praise you with all my heart. Say, God, I want to praise you with all my heart. Say it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Sorry. I, you know, I'm, I'm leaving in a month, you know, or something. I don't know when, but Mark is staying here, so he has to apologize. I don't think I apologize. I apologize. If I offended somebody, but it's true. If you read the book of the Psalms, it's full of songs that it says, you know, raise your hand to God, clap to Him, shout of joy. It's crazy. All right, anyway, sorry. I want to say something before I start preaching. It's going to be not a good day for you guys if you're going to go home. And eat. Uh, no, I'm going to try to keep it. But I don't want to say something. Last week, the pastor started to collect the money for the new building, and I totally agree with this vision. The building got to be in function, and the kids got to go on the other side, while the babies are there, it's amazing, it's an amazing plan, it's a godly plan, we gotta do it. So, when we got home, uh, later on in the week, Miriam, oh, I'm, how old is Miriam, 11? I don't even know my children's age, Jesus. I, mean, I have four, you gotta forgive me. So she came to me and said, when the pastor said that, I just felt like giving $50. $50. For her, that's an amazing thing. And so I'm like, okay, I don't know, I don't think she did yet because I have no money, but I will do that for her. So that's an amazing thing. I'm like, that's one of the gifts, that's one of the deposit. That's a deposit. We are giving people. You gotta give. I want to tell you a story that Max Lucado said. He said it was an, an old guy and he made a lot of money all of his life, but he was very stingy. Say stingy. Is that the way you say it? Okay, so. Cheap, tight, like the man in the Bible has a crippled hand, you know, he didn't stretch it. Stretch your hand in the name of Jesus and bless the people. And so this guy was so, and so he saved all of his money in two luggage, two pieces of luggage. And he said, one day he went to his wife and said, I got it. She said, what did you get? I, I know what to do. So she said, what are you talking about? He said, when I die, I know how to get my money with me, how to bring my money with me. She said, what are you going to do? She said, he said, I'm going to get the, the two pieces of luggage and I'm going to put them in the attic. Is that the way you, the way you call it, attic? Uh, attic, attic, attic. I'm from Alabama. Anyway, so he said, so when I die and my soul is going to leave my body, I'm going to pass through the attic, I'm going to stretch my hands and I'm going to grab the, the luggage and I'm going to carry it with me. She said, you're right. I don't mind. Anyway, 
He died, eventually he got sick and he died. A few days later, after the memorial, memorial service, the funeral, whatever, the lady said, the pieces of luggage, you know, money, you know, right? She, was, she went upstairs to check if the luggage was still there. And guess what? Who says that it was not there anymore? Who says that? Two people? <laughs> You're wrong, I'm sorry. You can, I'm sorry, and that was a trick, buddy. You can't take anything with you. Naked you were born and naked you're gonna die. So she went up there and there they were. The two pieces of luggage. And you know what she said? I knew I should have put it in the basement. <laughs> you got it, you got it, you got it. You got it? <laughs> because if you see each other, if you're gonna make it into hell. Just... I'm not gonna say because it's the blood of Jesus, he saves you. But if you see each other, no, that's a part of your life that needs to be redirected by God. You can teach other people to give if you don't give. <laughs> Whoa, the thing is moving by itself. Don't play games with me. Alright, so I'm going to speak uh, today about something that uh, I'm going to talk about a man today that probably many of you didn't hear about in the Bible because it's not a person that you, you know, Paul, Peter, James, or Jesus, or Moses, be pretty known guys. This guy, his name is Mephibosheth. I hope I'm talking, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning his name in the right way, but uh, I'm going to say that anyway, this way. Mephibosheth. There's the TH at the end. Oh, yeah, yeah. I struggle with H's. Okay, so Mephibosheth. Who knows Mephibosheth from the Bible? I got a few folks over there. But like I thought, many of you don't. So today you're going to know about this guy. You're going to meet him. Okay, you want to meet him? I'm going to read this one verse and I, this is an interesting story. And I pray that God uses my tongue in this language that I don't really know how to speak the same way as I speak Italian, of course. You want to speak in Italian? It's going to be fast, huh? <laughs> but you don't understand it. So, I know that this word is for somebody in particular. Last night as I was uh, feeling the message, I said, I know that this message is for one person in particular. And making that to one person in particular, the message is for everybody. And it brought me back to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, chapter 6. When Isaiah saw the Lord. You remember he saw the Lord? And what happened? God, what did God say? Who shall go for me? Who shall I say? Who shall go for us? Do you remember this? And what did Isaiah say? It's one of the most preached messages in the Bible. He said, here I am. Send me. We got a few people that are engaging. Praise God. I ask a lot of questions because I want people to be engaged. Okay? So here I am. Send me. Wait a second. It's the sixth chapter of Isaiah. And Isaiah started to, to, to prophesy in chapter 1. Was he not sent before? Now there was a difference. You can be called by God, but you will not be sent until you do God what God tells you. Isaiah used the gift for five chapters. And if you read the fifth chapter of Isaiah, you will find that he many times says, Woe to those, woe to those who do this, and woe to those who do that. And then in chapter 6, when he sees the Lord, he says, Woe to me. Because in the reality of God, when you use your gifting, and the reality of God, you have to understand that you are just like the people. You're not going to tell the people what to do because you're mad at them because the Bible says so. You have to comprehend yourself with them because we are lost and saved by grace like everybody else. Nobody's better than another. That's the best approach you can have with the kingdom of God and in the, in, before the throne of God. God, I'm a sinner. So that's what Isaiah says. says I, God, I've seen the Lord and yet I, 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 my mouth is dirty and I live among a people with dirty mouths. And then the, the angel came with a hot coal and purified his speech, his way of talking. And he stopped saying, what to you, condemning people for their sins. And he started to be one of them and just tell them, deliver the word of the Lord. The book of Isaiah is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is considered the gospel of Isaiah. Because he spoke of Jesus, the birth, the prophecy about his birth, his, his growing up, his crucifixion, everything about in the streets, 
He was in Isaiah 700 years before he was born. And so this is what it is for everybody. But it's just for somebody that will say, I'm ready to purify myself. I'm ready to adjust the way I see people and the way I see you, God. And the way I see myself, by the way. And then that's when he can go. Because, you know, Isaiah had, had other prophets prophesying with him at the same age. If you, if you study the history of the prophets and the kings during that time, there were other prophets prophesying in Israel or in Judah. He was not the only prophet. Like Elijah thought, he was not the only prophet. The only one who's left. Now I have 7,000 prophets. Don't worry. 7,000 people. They didn't bow on their knees. And there were other, if you read the last few chapters of First Kings, after the story of Elijah that starts in chapter 17, you read the last couple of chapters and you see there's men of God and prophets of God, the prophets signed here and there. So there were prophets. It was not just Elijah. So it's not just about us. There is other people, and I know there are other people in this room. And if you take it humbly today, if you don't take it from me, don't take this message from me, you don't even know me. Most of you don't know me. Okay, some of you might have a preconceived idea, other people might have heard something good, something bad. Trust me, I have a history before God, me and my wife, of good doing behind me. I can surely take the mic and come before you and say, I'm a sinner saved by grace. But I have a good quality of life in the kingdom of God. Amen. A good quality. And nobody can point and say, but you did this three years ago or eight years ago. And I say this humbly. Because there are many people that show off with microphones and they have large crowds. And then they go commit adultery. And then they do many bad things. And they still keep the mic in their hands. I'm not such a man and I'm never going to be. And if I fall, you're never going to see me again. I'm sorry, I'm going to be saved, I'm going to return to Jesus, but I'm going to do this, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. It's a one, it's a one, it's a commitment. A friend of mine just divorced his wife after 25 years, more, maybe 30 years of marriage and four children. Why did you do that, I said. After Bible school, why did you do that? Well, we never loved each other. And then I talked to him more specifically because I was sad. He was one of my best, like you, Marcus. It's one of my best friends. And I was sad for days, for months, I didn't talk to him. Finally, I said, I got to release this. What happened? After being on the mission field, two years at Brownsville, school of ministry, two, uh, two years plus the, the six months abroad. What happened after four children? It's a life from the devil. If you don't feel love for your wife, you stick with her. Love is not a feeling. You can have that sparkling feeling when you're a teenager and you look at somebody and, she, and you like her or she likes you. And you can have that sparkling moment, but that's going to disappear. I guarantee you it's going to disappear. Even with God, you're not going to feel it. When you're going to say, God, I don't feel the sparkling love anymore. I'm going to betray you. Whatever happened to integrity, to faithfulness in this country? Whatever happened to faithfulness in this country? When men of God can leave their spouse because God talked to them. God talk to them. Leave your wife. I want you to marry your secretary. Why? Because she's 10 years young. That's why. <laughs> you need blunt people? I'm here. It's the truth. And I, I, you know, I understand the struggles that people go through. I try to hear the heart. I'm a pastor. I hear the hearts of people. And I really embrace many people that really do stupid, make stupid choices. That's my pastoral side. But then I gotta say the truth as, as well. I'm not gonna pack and say, sure. And you know what? When you're done loving this girl, choose another one. Why? Why not? Why not? If you did it with the first wife, then that means that you can do it with the second wife after five years of marriage. Is that correct? You understand what I'm talking about? If you don't feel that love, you got a covenant before God that you have to honor. And if somebody um, attempts and tempts you, you should pray hard and say, God, I don't want this. And you should kick it out of your life. That's what men of God do. That's what women of God do. But today, the message is for you to have another chance. Another chance. Another possibility. So I'll talk to you about, I'm going to talk to you about this Mephibosheth. And I'm going to read one verse in 2 Samuel 4.4. 4, if we have it, 
on the screen if you bought your Bible. Second Samuel 4.4, 4, I don't see anymore. Jesus touched my vision. Are you with me? Yeah. What's going on in the room here? What's going on in the room here? Are you guys here? Yeah. You're going to be happy about the message, don't worry. You know, Jesus talked to the guy in the, one of the pastors of the book of Revelation of the churches of Asia. He said, you think that you can see? You think that you're good? You're miserable. You're wretched. You're blind. You stink. And you know what he told him at the end? Those of my love, I rebuke. How many of you is rebuked, is rebuked by God? My hand is up, guys. I'm telling you. He rebukes me all the time. But I never felt like, oh, he rebuked me. Oh. No, I always have, thank you, God, for telling me. Because he wants me, make me, he wants to make me better. So if I pray at the altar and I'm done, God, use me. God, use me. God, use me. And then he said, Chiro, you got a problem. What's the problem? This. I'm not going to say like, I'm going to say thank you God because I prayed and you revealed me why I cannot take the next step. And many of you are stuck down there. You're going to see something very interesting about this guy. This is the verse. Is it there? No. Yes? Okay, it says, Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. Say crippled. Everybody say crippled. Everybody say crippled. Thank you. That was for everybody else. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Let me give you a background, because if I don't give a background, for the most of you, 80% of the church don't know who's Mephibosheth. I just want to give you a background of what happened before these events. So, Samuel, we are in the book of Samuel. Samuel was the king of Israel. Samuel is the reason why I gave my son the name Samuel. Because there's one verse, I believe it's in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. When Samuel went to anoint David, David. Samuel, what's going on here today? When he went to anoint David, king of Israel, he had prayed previously, and one night he spent the whole night before God, because God said, remove Saul from kingship. I'll tell you Saul in a second. And when he went up there, he went to Bethlehem, the city of Jesus. Do you understand the connections here? He went to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town came down and saw him coming. And when they saw him, the Bible said, they start shaking. And they said, do you come in peace? I come in peace. Anything you would ask the prophet, he would tell you. Even if you lost your coins. Even if you lost your shoes. If you don't find the shoes called Samuel, he's going to tell you. He was so much of a great prophet. He was the last judge of Israel. You remember before Samuel and Ruth, there is also the book of Judges. Because there was, a, there was a period of time after the, the Israelites came out of the land of Egypt, they conquered the land with Joshua. And after that period of time, the period of judges began. Jephthah, uh, Samson, Gideon, these guys are Deborah. These guys were judges. They ruled the country. There was not a king. There was not a kingdom. It was just tribes and a judge that were ruled. There was prophets, of course. Well, with Samuel... The, the people said, we want a king. We want to be like the other nations. He was displeased about this. And God said, don't be displeased about this. They didn't reject you as a judge. I mean, the words. As a judge, they rejected me as their God. Yeah. So give them a king. They didn't even choose Samuel as a king. He was also a priest. He would function as a priest. Even though he did not come from a family of priesthood. Because he was consecrated by Hannah, or Anna, I call her, uh, in the temple, was given to Eli, you know, the, the priest Eli, Eli, with his two children, and he grew up in the temple, so he, he offered sacrifice and he did stuff that pertained to the, the temple and the, 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 uh, the offerings and the things of, that a priest does. Even though there was not a temple, there was a tabernacle that was, uh, that was pitched over there. So this is Samuel. And Samuel 
God told Samuel, I want that guy over there. He was a mighty guy. He was a strong guy. Talking about warriors and, and uh, military. He was a very strong guy. His father was a kish. was a very strong guy. His name was Saul. He was strong. Listen to me. He was very tall. I think he was the tallest in Israel. But he had another quality that is very important. You better listen right now if you want to serve God. He was humble. So humble that he went to hide behind the luggage. When they were prophesying about who where is the king. And God said, he's right. He's hiding right there. He was not hiding for fear. He was hiding because he was humble. God told, told Samuel in chapter 15. And Samuel told Saul, when you were humble, God made you the ruler over these people Israel. But then you got to you start to feel, be filled with pride. And he sinned. He sinned, he sinned in a bad, bad way. And God said, remove this guy. I don't want that. We already went through this. Remove him. Now let me ask you a question. When a, a king is removed from his position of king, of kingship, who's the heir? Do you say heir or heir? Is that an H in here? Heir. heir? There is an H, but you don't pronounce it, obviously. Because what, the only time that I pronounce like honor, no, it's honor. But there is an H, but you don't pronounce it. All the other times, you pronounce the H. But heir, great, thank you, good thing I asked. Heir. The heir was Jonathan, right? Well, unfortunately, Jonathan and Saul died in the same day. Now, let me, follow me, please. Why did the nurse run away in haste? The nurse ran away in haste, and I know some of you know it, thank you. She ran away in haste because generally, when another king was going was gonna to take the position of king on the throne, would take the, the monarchy, you know, the throne, he would go and kill everybody else that were, that were part of that family. Because that family was the royal lineage. As a matter of fact, I don't remember the chapter right now, maybe chapter, I don't remember the chapter. Maybe chapter two. They, uh, there was a guy named Abner, he was the, the leader, he was a, a mighty warrior, uh, and he made Ishbosheth, it's another guy, he made him king over Israel and he ruled for two years until they killed him. So the reason why the lady fled and hurried up and left the, the, the place because she was scared they're gonna kill him. So I, I want you to listen right now, it's the first application. God might have give you something. I want you to listen very carefully, everybody. Don't get distracted, please. This is fundamentally important for your future. Young or old, everybody listen. God is giving you a call. He is giving you giftings. He is giving you talents. You were strong. You were called by God. But then something happened to you. And I'm talking to many people. But that's why you're not in the position you were supposed to be. Then something happened to you and you start to be scared. The lady, the word nurse, it's the, the Hebrew word aman. Aman. I can say this word however I want because it's Hebrew, it's not English. And it means, listen, it, it means to build, to support, sustain, to be foster, to foster or parent. To make firm the very thing she was supposed to do, she didn't do in the moment of need. Because we are all good when everything works okay. And in the moment of need, whether it's called Corona, whether it's called anybody else coming into your life to mess it up, because there are such things even as people coming with the purpose of destroying you, some people don't even know that they're doing it, but they do, right? And so what do you do in that moment? You get scared, you creep with fear, and you run away, causing that very thing to cripple. Because maybe you're scared of antagonists, other people that might take the position that God wants to give you. That guy has a beautiful voice. Maybe he's going to take my spot one day. That girl plays the guitar very well. Maybe I'm not going to be a guitar player anymore. Oh, that guy's a good preacher. That one guy's a good... Teacher, and he's a good pastor, he's this, and we can scared other people, and we become intimidated. You know why you become, become intimidated? Because you don't believe what God told you in the first place. 
Because if God says, Shiro, you're going to be this for me. I don't care who comes in my way. They can be 10,000 times better than me. I'm going to stand firm in the position that God gave me. And if he gave me this pulpit here in Pithu, nobody's going to take it away from me. Amen. Even if they do take it away from me, nobody will take it away. And I thought, I'm, I'm saying this to say any call in your life that you thought it was yours, that God talked to you about, whether it was prophecy, whether it was teaching, whether it was whatever it was, I don't care what it was. You know I mean? Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's a job. By the way, I'm a stone mason at the tiles and stones, and if you don't work, I'm here. <laughs> so maybe it's a job position, maybe something that God called you to do, because not everybody should be a pastor, otherwise everybody was standing here preaching, nobody on the other side. Right? I understand that. So I'm just saying, whatever God called you to do, if you didn't do it, it's not because God was not able, but because you got scared and you crippled your very gift because you start to look around and you didn't keep your focus on God and you start disobeying Him and you start your own way. Mephibosheth means destroyer of idols. It also means dispeller of shame. As a matter of fact, the idol is a shameful thing. That's how the word idol is translated. It's a shameful thing, an idol. It's a shameful thing. So he's a, he's a destroyer of shame. And yet, he's living in shame right now. From five years old, because of a lady that messed up. And this is a teaching. Many parents will cripple their child and somebody else has to pay for it. And this is actually by the mistakes of Saul, not even of Jonathan, the son of Saul. By the mistakes of the grandparent of Mephibosheth. Saul was the king. And his son had to die with him in war because he made poor choices. The father made poor choices. And the, the, the grandson got crippled because they died. So who's the fault here in terms of human understanding? Saul. So the grandfather had the son and the grandchild die. Or, or get crippled. Messed up the whole land of Israel. He was a mess. But it was in the purposes of God. You know why? Because uh, Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. And the prophecy of Genesis 50 was that Judah was going to have a scepter. And nobody would remove the scepter forever. Talking about the coming of Jesus through a lineage of kings from the tribe of Judah. As a matter of fact, David was from the tribe of Judah. And you might ask... Why was Saul there from the tribe of Je Benjamin? Well, the Bible said that God chose Saul. Why? Because he was the best fit for that moment. But his heart was not with God. What if he, he kept his heart, you know, uh, pure before God? I don't know. What if Eve didn't eat the fruit? I don't know. I don't, certain answers I don't have. But for sure God chose it and chose it for good. And then he said, I don't know what there anything to do. Because the dynamics, of, the dynamics of God, you can really understand. But God knew, and he said, I gotta find somebody that is a warrior, he's strong, and can manage my people. Listen to me. Saul was not a pastor, he was not a prophet. You can choose a man of God to be the leader of a country. You gotta choose an economic strategist, a war strategist, a person that knows how to do stuff in the country and outside the country. You can't expect that Donald Trump is going to be Pastor David, because he's not. But he's a great strategist and a great economist. You should look at those words you in a key and not his mouth. Even though I pray in Jesus' name, and he was already changing a lot, that his mouth will change. But that's a very small fraction of everything that's good that he's doing for the Christians, for Israel in this country, and everywhere in the world. So Saul was a great warrior. A great warrior. And you know how many kings have been used by God in the history? Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar made an edict. And he said, if somebody curses the God of Daniel, I'll kill him. He was the king of Babylon. He was not the king of Israel. Darius did the same thing with Daniel. Daniel, your God, stands forever. Belshazzar, another king of Babylon. Cyrus. King of Persia gave up the authority to rebuild suddenly the state. The word of God came to Cyrus. Cyrus is a Persian god. He's the one who defeated the 
Babylonian Empire, killing people. What happened? God talked to him. He chose him to deliver his people. Why a foreign God? Because they are better than our God. I'm not a foreign, excuse me. A foreign king because they are better than our kings. I mean, I mean let me see. So he chose foreigners that can fulfill his purposes. And you can say anything about it. He chose Pharaoh. Pharaoh. He didn't give a dream to Joseph. If you remember the story, he gave the dreams of the of the fat cows and of the, I the, do you call the speaker? Are you helping me, please? No, no, but also the other dream. He had two dreams. Ah, the wheat, whatever they are called. And, and, and Joseph revealed this dream because Joseph was a spiritual man. You see, the men, the, the men that are up there, they better surround themselves with prophets and Christians and people that know how to interpret the right things. Because he can't interpret it. I understand and I agree with you. But the other people around him, they can interpret it. It's a revelation that God gave me 40 years ago. Four years ago. And so God chose Pharaoh to deliver, to deliver, you know who? Huh? God chose Pharaoh to deliver Jesus from dying. What are you saying, brother? I'm going to tell you, if you follow me, you're going to get a great revelation. The 70 people, Joel, uh, Jacob and his people, his children, between which there was Judah, they were in the famine. And they would send the brothers back to Egypt to get the, the bread. You remember that? You remember that? Had not Joseph been sold and had God not given the dream to save the world to Pharaoh, Judah would have died in the famine. And Judah is the carrier of the holy lineage that brings to Jesus. You would have not have a salvation today because Jesus could not be born outside of that lineage. From Seth on all the way, read Matthew 1 for the genealogy. And so God said, I'm, I got to save Jesus, which I got to save Judah and Israel. How am I going to do it? I'm going to give us a, a dream to Pharaoh. Pharaoh thought he was a God, and yet God chose him. So say, thank you, God, for choosing even people that are living in equity. And then if God can change them, that's even better. We get another guy in our congregations, right? That's the way you read it. You read it spiritually, not carnally. Sorry for the parenthesis. I didn't really want to do this, but it came out and I'm sorry. Do you know what, what Mephibosheth, let's go back to the story, Mephibosheth, he goes and hides himself in a house in Lodebar. Lodebar means without a shepherd, without pastor. Oh, pastor? Did you say pastor? You don't really say the team? Is that right? Without pastor, without a shepherd, without somebody to feed him. And many times you have fallen away, you have ran away, and you have refused to be pastor. You have refused to be, to receive a shepherd of your head that could feed you the word of God. And you find yourself to be now an adult, on a wheelchair, desolated, without a call, knowing that your forefathers were a lineage of kings. The region where Lodabar is, it's the region of Manasseh. Manasseh, or Manasseh, I don't know how you pronounce that. It doesn't matter the pronunciation, as it is important, the meaning, it means forgetting. And now you are in a position in Lodabar where there is no shepherd, there is no word of God for you, you are in desolation, and you want to forget. You are forgotten, and, and you want to forget. And you say, well, I'm not going to get out of here. You don't even think that you want to get out of there. Because you like the place where you are, you're hiding in fear. And the things that God had given you in the beginning, they are at stake. The caregiver, the caregiver was named Makir, and his name means sold. All the words of this scenario are words that tell me, like Joseph was sold into Egypt. Jesus was sold by Judas. This, it talks about a negative aspect. He's been sold into a negative life because of the fear of that lady, because of the mistakes of the father and the grandfather. 
and he's reaping the fruit, but he's not doing anything to raise himself up. And unfortunately, the story ends up in this way. And I'm wondering today, how many of you are in love about without pastor? You don't accept words anymore. You don't accept correction. You don't accept a guide. You don't accept a, a, a leading of anybody because you thought you were the prophet. You thought you were that teacher. You thought you were that pastor. You thought you were that evangelist. You thought you were that great guy or that great woman, but somebody got in the way and now you yourself are crippling yourself and you are in love about it. And you try to forget in Manasseh. Say forget. Everybody's sleepy, but say forget. Say forget, please. We're not going to leave on this. Say forget. Everybody, say forget. Thank you, I appreciate it. But God. Exactly, that's right. But God. Chapter 9, everybody, turns to chapter 9 of 2 Samuel, please. And cry over this. Cry over the mercy of God. Chapter 9 of 2 Samuel. David said, Is there still anyone left in the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? All of a sudden, all of a sudden from nowhere, God stirs up the heart of David. The heart of the king. King. God is the king. He's the king of kings. And said, is there anybody left in the house of Saul? Because I want to do them right. And they pick up this guy, that, which means idols actually. And the idol guy, his name means idol. He go picks up, you know, uh, Mephibosheth, which is a destroyer of idol. Look at the satire of God here. Look at the words that God uses to, to identify himself like I'm the one who creates and moves all the things around. Nothing perfect moves unless I'm there. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from God, from the Father of light. And nobody can destroy his plan. That's what Job says when you keep yourself in integrity. He said, anyone he left that I may show him kindness. For the sake of who? Jonathan, because you know the story, David and Jonathan were very good friends, right? They loved each other. There's a psalm about his friend. Actually, they said he was betrayed, but it doesn't matter. Jonathan, the word Jonathan means Jehovah has given. Jehovah, or Yahweh, I guess, Yahweh is better. Yahweh has given. What has Yahweh given? What has Yahweh given? He has given his only son. So whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So Jehovah has given, it means Jesus. So is there anybody of the house of Saul that I can do good to for the sake of Jesus? That's how God views your past call today. He's calling you and said, stop right there. I know you are in love about without pastor or without shepherd. Or without feed. I know you are in the land of the forgotten. I know that you want to forget your past. I know you're crippled. You can't move because maybe you made so many mistakes. Don't blame other people. But I'm looking for someone who's coming to me. And I can revive the call. Do you know what happens? I'm not going to read it because it's going to be too long. David told Told Mephibosheth, you will stay here in the kingdom and you will sit at my table and eat with me every day. That's what Jesus does. He said, I'm knocking at the door and if you open the door, I'll enter and we will dine together. That's a figure of Jesus. That's a type of the Jesus kingdom where God, the Father, through uh, the, the, the action of David, calls for somebody that was previously his enemy. Saul tried to kill David twice with a javelin. And he said, can I do anything good to those who persecuted me? And maybe at one time you were an enemy of God. But God is not going to hold you accountable for that. Because Jesus was pierced for you. Stand up everybody. I hope I did right with the time. I didn't keep it in my mind. And I'm not even going to make an altar call. I'll leave this to Pastor David if he wants to. I just want you to close your eyes from the place where you are. Please 
Don't look around. This is a very special moment for you. I know that some of you, God, they talked. All of you, other, other people are so distracted. They don't even care. And they can't wait to go home. As the notes of the keyboard begin to create an atmosphere, that's what David did when Saul was possessed by a devil. He would come there and would take the heart, heart as an H there, take the heart and play it, and the demon will leave just with the sound of the heart. So music is very important. And as this is set in place right now, I just want to talk to you. And I hope that you make a decision in your heart. You don't have to come here next to me. For whoever understood, besides my language barrier, whoever understood the concept of what I said, maybe you understood some dynamics that you, you yourself have, uh, have created. And I want to take you back in time to the days when you were called by God and you start to exercise His giftings, when you start to started to exercise His talents that He taught you, and the spiritual insight that you had, and I don't know what happened in your life. I know, I know the Bible says you don't swear, and I don't care about the cat. Okay, I don't, you know, I don't care about anything. God knows my heart. Samuel, I know that uh, talking to the pastor's brother, I didn't know you were coming this morning. And when David called you, I didn't even see you from the back. I didn't know it was you. This message was done yesterday. David does know about the message. And I didn't know that you were coming. Absolutely. Actually, I believe this is the first time I see in this church. Me personally. And I know that you've talked to me when I saw you before. And when David started to talk to you like that, I understood why God yesterday told me it's for everybody, but it's for one person in particular. And I didn't know what he was talking about because she can be a person in particular and she can. It's not that it's not for you, the message. It's also for you for sure. But maybe God today is calling you by name and the book from which I read carries your name. You know, if you don't prophesy, Pastor David, you're never going to prophesy. They will never know what God was saying. Even if I don't understand it, God gave me this message. And trust me, as I said before, there was an Isaiah. But there were other prophets that were prophesying during that time. So this is not just for Isaiah. The call is also for you. Close your eyes, please. Don't get distracted. For any of you, if you run away and you are in a place all alone without a, a shepherd in Lodeba, in the land of Manasseh, the land of the forgotten, under the jurisdiction say that I heard the Lord on his throne saying these words is there anybody that I can bless today for the sake of what Jesus did on the cross is there anybody to whom I can renew the call I can renew the talents the giftings is there anybody out there that would admit his own mistakes her own mistakes and follow me because I swear says the Lord because he can swear for sure and the Bible says that he will lead at my table in my palace all the days of his life and if you think that your life was over because you were crippled I want to tell you God is calling you to eat next to his table for the rest of your life if you want to accept this call today I don't even ask you to raise your hands. I don't care to see you or not. Just say it in your heart. God, I'm Milodebar. I'm forgotten. I'm crippled. 
Sometimes it's been somebody else's mistake. But I reap the fruit of all that has happened. I want to come back. I know you sent a word so that they could call me. And I could come and enter the gates of the kingdom that once were mine to see that dine with you. Say it. Tell God. He can do it. He can restore your position. He can restore your legs, your feet, your ankles. He can give you strength like in chapter 3 of the book of Acts. He says that the power of God came to the ankles of that guy that was straight, was strengthened. And he stood up and started raising his voice, jumping and yelling, praising God. And if this is you, and you have prayed, then you're going to see what is going to happen in the next days, in the next months. But hear me. Don't make the mistakes you have made previously. And I, you know, I didn't want to tell you this, but I'm going to do it. Because this is where the message ends, right here. I do want to give you another information. Later on in life, Mephibosheth started to create an insurrection against David. And I believe that David had mercy, didn't kill him. Even though he was a threat. He let him leave because of the covenant he had made with Jonathan, his father. Uh, it's not I believe, it is like that. So don't do like Mephibosheth, who came to the kingdom, ate by the king. He ate the best food, and he was kind of one, one of the, the leader of the country. If he's there with the leader, he's working with him, right? Did he have to reject the goodness that he received? To get more that was not given, was never given to him in the first place because his grandfather was from the tribe of Benjamin. Do you understand what I'm saying? I know it's a little bit deep. I don't generally teach, but when I do, I, I like to go deeper. And so if you understand these parameters, these dynamics, I want to leave you with this. Pastor? Some of you, this word was probably a little deep, but it's very powerful. Go back and listen to it. I'd like every head bowed, every eye closed in this house for just one moment. You know, the church is a habit, and there's nothing wrong with it. But sometimes we put too much stock on trying to get someone to come to an altar and confess Jesus. But I want you to know something. It's a heart's change. It's a decision of the mind and the heart by faith. If you hear this morning, you say, Pastor David, I have walked away from God, or I am not serving God, or I don't even know Him. But I hear what the preacher said today, and I, I, I want Jesus in my life. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If that's you, slip your hand up. Let me see where you're at. Anyone at all? Okay, thank you. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I've been close to God, but I walked away. I'm coming back where I belong. If that's you, slip your hand up where you're at. Anyone at all? Thank you. Thank you. Father, right now you see the hands that are raised. And we make a decision. Say that with me. You can do it quietly in your heart and mind. Jesus, I make the decision to come back where I belong. In my heart, by faith, with my mouth, I confess I'm coming where I belong with you. I come home to you. In Jesus' name. And all it takes from this moment to pursue Him, that's all there is to it. You receive it, and you pursue Him. 
Father, let your word today burn in our spirits. Lord, let us realize no matter where we've gone to, how crippled we may feel, that there's a place at the king's table for us. And it's a place of blessing and promise. Lord, that you want to show us off to the world. So God, we speak to the spiritual crippling assignments of hell and we say be crippled no more in the name of Jesus. We speak to every wound, every assignment, Lord, every discouragement, every fear. Lord, every person, Lord God, that's at the sound of our voice, we say let the worshipers arise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. I challenge some of you on Facebook, put on your royal clothes and go sit at the king's table because there's a place made specifically for you. And let your life be fruitful and productive for the kingdom. In Jesus' name. Well, Pastor, my life is past. God is not done with you yet. Lord, we bless this word into the hearts of your people. Thank you for each one that's come here today. Let us walk in the anointing. Lord, we will see an outpouring, an outbreak of your spirit. We will see revival like we've never seen it before. And every person that you would bring into this house will be a part of that spirit of revival that will touch a nation, that will touch a city, that will touch a world. God, we declare the power of the Holy Spirit is about to break out. And you are causing a stirring in the hearts of your people from the north, the south, the east, and the west to put on the royal garments and to get to the king's table where there can be healing and strength and peace and victory and purpose. In Jesus' matchless mighty name, we all said, amen. amen, amen, amen. Can you give the Lord a big shout of praise? Come on, the biggest shout that you can give him. Come on. Maybe a little whistle if you can do that too. Lord, we praise you. We honor you in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for coming. Those on Facebook, some that couldn't make it, we missed you. And if you know someone that's not here, give them a call this week. Remember the daily words, the prayer meetings, the youth services, all that's going on. God bless you. We love you. Don't hug somebody's neck. Don't shake somebody's hand. But tell them you love them. God bless you.